On this Monday night, thousands were expecting an emergency alert delivered straight to their phone. Didn't happen. The system is meant to warn about imminent danger, fires, floods, terror attacks. Instead, across Ontario and Quebec, there was confusion. Now, it may have been just a test, but why did it fail? Also tonight, holding back the floodwaters one good deed at a time. How communities in New Brunswick are banding together to save homes from being washed away. And driving while Canadian, why an Ontario woman got thrown in jail for driving through the state of Georgia. This is The National. The idea is simple. In case of emergency, notify Canadians by sending an alert to our smartphones. That system was tested today in Ontario and Quebec, and thousands of people waited for a warning. Some got it, many though never did. Already? Oh, there it is. Neither did I. <laughs> this is a wow. test of Ontario's alert-ready system. I'm done. There is no danger to safety. So how is this supposed to work, and why did it go wrong? The CBC's Natalie Collada went looking for answers. <laughs> Nothing. Nada. Zip. It wasn't what Quebecers were told they were to hear on their smartphones this morning. The alert ready system should have gone off on compatible smartphones at 9.55 a.m., sounding like this. Instead, silence. We're used to failure in Canada. <laughs> that makes me a bit nervous in the end, actually. A spokesperson for the CRTC says the failure in Quebec was due to human error. An extra space was accidentally typed into the code sequence. The new phone alerts are in addition to the current broadcast system, and today's test in Quebec did go out on TV and radio. But hours later, in Ontario, another test followed by more confusion. I haven't, uh, haven't got one yet. Well, definitely, I'll be waiting for an explanation. Some received the alert. Oh, I got it. Yeah, I got it. Others got it late, some received it twice, and some didn't get it at all. It's still not clear why. The company that operates the system, Palmarek, says it's working with its partners to identify the cause. Eamon Hoey says when you're dealing with that much data, delays are a fact of life. So if you have a computer and you're sending a message out to a number of your friends, it doesn't mean that everybody's going to get your message exactly at the same time you, you press the send switch. Keep in mind, the system doesn't work with every smartphone and it requires an LTE network. But today, even some customers who met both requirements didn't get an alert. A missile may impact on land or sea within minutes. Once the technical issues are resolved, the system isn't guaranteed to be error-free. Earlier this year in Hawaii, a false alert was sent out warning of an inbound ballistic missile causing panic. In Saskatchewan, in January, staff sent out flood and wildfire alerts by mistake. Today's test proves that there's still work to do. I will need to talk to the technical experts to see uh, how, how serious uh, a technical flaw uh, existed today and whether this is simply a matter of, of somebody making a coding error or whether it's, it's, uh, it's more profound. The company gets another shot on Wednesday. The alert system is scheduled to be tested across the rest of the country, with the exception of Nunavut. And Natalie, tellingly, you had an interesting experience standing next to your producer when these alerts were supposed to go out. Well, that's right. We had the exact same phone on the same network. She received the alert immediately. It took about five minutes before I received it. We know that that is an experience that many people have been having, some, of course, not even getting that alert at all. Yeah, lots of people in our newsroom didn't get it at all. And as of tonight, we still don't know why. And we don't know how many. That's the other really interesting thing. We don't know why some people got the alert, why some people didn't, even if they had a newer phone on a major network in a big city, let alone people in rural communities with perhaps older phones. That's another element to that, of that as well. And so we are waiting for that information. We've been calling, we've been asking, but we don't have it yet. This was, of course, a test, and we'll see when it rolls out most of the rest of the country on Wednesday if it goes any more smoothly. Thanks, Natalie. You're welcome. So the emergency system meant to send you these alerts on your cell phones is the same one that's been delivering warnings to television and radio stations since 2014, and here's how it's supposed to get to you. The alert starts with emergency management officials in a federal, provincial, or territorial government. They decide if an alert needs to be issued because of an imminent threat to life, 
For example, it can be sent by Environment Canada because of a tornado or flood warning. Or in some cases, by a local police department for an Amber Alert or a terrorist threat. The message gets entered into something called the National Alert Aggregation and Dissemination, or NAD, system. Palmarex, the parent company of the Weather Network, operates it. That system then communicates with radio and television stations and your wireless company to ask them to broadcast the alert in the affected area. This is all meant to happen within seconds of that alert being issued, and the government says it's then up to you to stop and listen and respond to the message. Now, the United States has a similar wireless emergency alert system. It's had it since 2012, and it has been used more than 33,000 times to warn the public about dangerous weather, missing children, and other critical situations. In the aftermath of the Boston Marathon bombing, state officials sent a message warning people to take shelter in the building they were in rather than go outside. In 2016, after bombs went off in New York and New Jersey, the warning system was used to put out a digital wanted poster identifying the suspect. But even though the technology has worked in the U.S., there can be complications. When a baby was abducted in 2013, an alert was sent out at 4 o'clock in the morning. Many were upset at being disturbed, and there were concerns that people would then opt out of the system. And, Andrew, those alerts would come in handy for emergencies like the one that has been unfolding in New Brunswick. Yeah, certainly, though uh, the word spreading today was actually welcome news. Floodwaters are beginning to level off. They're receding in the north. And in St. John, they are expected to crest soon, maybe within 24 hours, and then start going down. But officials are urging people to be patient. When we talk about the water going down, that is not a trigger for people to go home, necessarily. A very deliberate process has to be followed to make sure it's safe for them to go home. About 1,200 people pushed out by floodwaters have registered with the Red Cross, but officials believe many more, maybe even three times as many, are out of their homes. And it could be a long time before they're back in their own beds. Out of probably 30 camps altogether, there's maybe five left. Devastating. Hot water tank, anything you can think of, anybody would have in memories and me mementos, it's... It's a shame it's just floating. New Brunswick's financial assistance program doesn't cover recreational properties in disasters, meaning camp or cottage owners are likely on their own, footing the whole bill for cleaning up and rebuilding. And with 100 roads still closed, including part of the Trans-Canada Highway, doesn't look like that'll happen for a while. But what has become clear to lots of folks in the flood zone, you can never have too many friends and neighbors. Sometimes they're the only thing standing between you and trouble. And as Jayla Bernstein learned, with enough hands, you can hold the water back. When the mounting St. John River threatened the doorstep of this historic church, the parish priest and his team of volunteers right didn't give up. So uh, the call went out to the community uh, and we had I don't know, 40 or 45 people here, all kind of coordinated, working together. As the floodwaters inched closer to St. Paul's, this is all that stood between the rising St. John River and nearly two centuries of history. We had a, a dump truck load of, of sand here. We had a team of people with uh, filling sandbags and basically realizing that if the wind comes up any more or the level goes up any higher, it's going to come right across, right into the foundation. The building itself escaped unscathed, yet the sandbags couldn't stop the river from finding a way inside. Beneath the church, the water threatens a brand new $5,000 furnace. It's just touching the bottom of the engine over there. So if it stops there, as good as it can get, I guess, but hopefully it doesn't go any higher. This image is just one of the toughest ones to see. Because as Reverend Kane surveys the damage, anything, what stings the most is the cemetery. Yeah, you've, you've been here with families like, at their moment of crisis, and now we're having our own kind of moment of crisis as a community, but these folks have fought floods in the past and we can't do anything for them. Kane says he's not the type of person who accepts defeat. With the church shored up, he led his team down the road where the river threatened to destroy a retirement dream. It was almost to the point of, we can't do this. It's just not gonna, we can't, we can't hold it back any longer. Then the troops arrived. Even the local bishop got his hands dirty. We had all kinds of, like with the fire department, um, neighbors. This man right here shoveled. Well, we worked away at it. Yes. <laughs> Everybody took yeah. their part. 
Now, a massive sandbag barrier holds the forceful river at bay. The retirement dream still alive. It's just been phenomenal. The offers of help and we're so grateful and feel very much a part of the community. But as Kane says, this is just what it means to be a New Brunswicker. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Oak Point, New Brunswick. Now, persevering in the face of what you can see is one thing. The high water, the submerged basements, the impassable roads. But there's also concern tonight about what lies beneath. Those floodwaters, officials say, are heavily contaminated. In places like Rothsay, New Brunswick, the floodwaters have overwhelmed sewage systems. So, unfortunately, what that means is that the sewage from Rothsay is still going into the river, but it's untreated. And because a lot of the flooding is in agricultural areas... You get uh, manure from uh, uh, manure piles around farms. All of that's going into the river system. Uh, I'm sure that there are animals that have, uh, have drowned that are in the river system. And then there's the threat from toxic chemicals. We also have to be vigilant for oil spills and um, diesel tank spills. That means stacking sandbags, wading into backyards. All of it carries risks. Without precautions, it's dangerous for property and dangerous for human health. Now, from the East Coast to the West Coast, flooding here, too, is wreaking havoc in B.C.'s interior. Here's the backyard. It's a bit of a river, but it's... Uh... There's really not too much you can do. You have to let the water go, eh? People near Merritt, about a three-hour drive northeast of Vancouver, seem to be in pretty good spirits, all things considered, despite flooding that's damaged homes and washed out roads. Dozens of properties are under an evacuation order, including this mobile home park, where residents say this is the worst flooding they've ever seen. So, Adrian, no shortage of challenges in both provinces, especially as you look at the long road ahead. The cleanup will be messy, expensive, and it'll take a while. And it will. Andrew, let's now turn to a story that has just had so many people talking today, especially if you've ever done that drive in the U.S. along the I-75. A woman named Emily Neald was stopped by police in Georgia. Now, she was speeding, but that wasn't what got her searched, cuffed, fingerprinted and locked up. It was her Canadian driver's license. Magda Gabrasalasa has the story of a young Ontario woman who found herself down south and up the proverbial creek. Okay, I'm in the back of a police car. I'm in cuffs. Help me. After Help Emily me. Neald was arrested in Adel, Georgia in April, she okay, appealed to friends on Snapchat. How were you feeling in that moment? I was terrified. The graduate student had finished her studies in Tennessee. On the way back from a road trip, she was stopped by Cook County, Georgia police for speeding. She gave the officer her Ontario driver's license. And she kept saying, no, Canadian licenses are not accepted. I was flabbergasted. I just kept saying this can't be right. Look at the truck drivers, look at people, snowbirds, people who vacation. A Canadian license is always valid. Neil said the officer wouldn't accept digital copies of her passport and Nexus card to confirm she's Canadian. Instead, she was cuffed and charged with driving without a license and speeding. It was the most horrendous incident of my life, I would say. It was mortifying. I was terrified. Hours later, she was released after paying a bond of more than $900, her next goal to get the charges dismissed. And I remember as soon as they took my fingerprints, they kept saying, you're now in the system. Georgia's government site says you can drive in the state with a valid foreign driver's license. It goes on to say that an officer can ask to see a passport or visa to verify a license if available. Let's take a look at a bit more of this. After Canadian consulate authorities and a lawyer took up the case, Neil's charges were dropped. We went ahead and just dismissed it as quickly as it came to my attention. I just felt like it probably became a bigger deal than it should have been, considering that she had, she was here studying and no prior trouble. And this Toronto lawyer isn't surprised by this. This is probably not the first time that it's happened and it won't be the last time that it happens. Court officials expect to have her record expunged in a couple of weeks. I just cried with joy. I was just so happy because I just kept thinking this would ruin me. Neil is now back home in Kleinberg, but she still wants answers. At least with the officer who arrested me, I would love to see a formal reprimand. An apology is what I would love the most.
And Magda joins me now. So, Magda, are we any clearer on why this seems to have happened to her? Well, the lawyer that we talked to couldn't see a very good reason for it, but the Cook County Sheriff's Office has released a statement in which they dispute much of Neil's account. So they're saying that she said she lived in Tennessee and because she didn't have a Tennessee driver's license, that is what prompted the arrest. They also say that, you know, the police force has the authority to set a bond, even with a speeding charge, when it comes to a driver who does not live in the country. Okay, so they're not backing down at all? Not at all. Okay, Magda, thanks very much. Thank you. To Ottawa now and concerns about what the government calls irregular migrants, people avoiding official border crossings, hoping to get refugee status. The numbers are on the rise again, and amid criticism from the opposition, federal officials said today that the asylum seekers are not getting a free ticket to Canada. In the first three months of this year, the RCMP intercepted more than 5,000 refugee claimants. Today, the government said there were about 2,500 more in April alone. Of those 7,500 asylum seekers, most came in from the U.S. at the Roxham Road crossing in Quebec. And with the warming weather, an average of 70 to 80 people are now arriving each day. So how to deal with all those people? As Catherine Cullen tells us, the Trudeau government says it has a plan. Those who cross in violation of the rules are immediately arrested. Their words were intended to reassure, but the fact three cabinet ministers came to town with props, no less. Uh, as this chart clearly demonstrates, all asylum claimants undergo the same process. Well, that suggests concern. The number of asylum seekers is up even compared to last year. They must prove that they need Canada's protection to keep them safe. Something it seems the vast majority of claimants can't prove. Around 90% of some groups are being rejected, the government says. But a new figure shows fewer than 1% have been removed from Canada. According to the government's own numbers, more than 26,000 people came to Canada by illegally crossing the border over the span of a year. Just 243 of them have been removed. Why so few? There are very important issues of due process that have to be met. Right now, it takes an average of about two and a half years for officials to decide on an asylum seeker's case. It's a whole sequence of events that need to be accelerated. That's why we put more money uh, into the system. The Conservatives have suggested changing the rules to bar people from simply walking across the border and claiming asylum, something the Liberals call impractical. We're not even at the point right now where we, we can actually start talking about how to support the tens of thousands of people who have come into the country by this meant. That is a completely different conversation. But for me, um, how are we ever going to talk about that if the problem only gets worse? The government is scheduled to remove 200 more failed asylum claimants in the next couple of weeks. At the same time, it's planning to set up temporary shelters at Quebec's Rocks and Road, anticipating even more illegal crossings. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Here's what else we're working on the National tonight. The campaign hasn't even officially started yet, but the Ontario election unofficially kicked off tonight with a televised debate. We have a play-by-play -play for you. And as campaign battlegrounds move increasingly online, our Hannah Thibodeau looks into some of the major questions elections officials need to answer. I'm a little bit more concerned from, from the outsiders. Uh, who can again, and if you look at the uh, US election and e even the uh, British uh, referendum, you see that outsiders uh, try to manipulate the electorate, and that's, that's a concern. tonight on the national playoff fever on the streets of Winnipeg. You're looking live at the scene just outside Bell MTS Place where thousands of Jets fans are gathered for tonight's game. An early lead for the Nashville Predators though. They're up 1-0 in the first period. Heading into tonight, it was the Jets though who were up 3-2 in the series. So a win for Winnipeg would mean they move on to the third round of the Stanley Cup playoffs. And let's take you now live to Toronto, where another playoff game has fans in the streets. The Toronto Raptors are taking on the Cleveland Cavaliers in game four of their series. 
and the stakes couldn't be higher. DeRozan goes in strong, stays with it. Right now, the Cavs are up in the third quarter. And because they won the first three games in the best of seven series, a loss for the Raptors would mean being knocked out of the playoffs. Exactly one month to go until Ontario voters head to the polls to elect the province's next government. The campaign is not even officially underway, but you wouldn't know it tonight because the leaders of the three main political parties squared off in their first debate. Kathleen Wynne and the governing Liberals are trying to extend their nearly 15-year hold on power while the other two leaders tried to show they have what it takes to be Premier. Ron Charles explains. Even though the election hasn't been officially called, the race is on. Ontario's main political party stuck to the tradition of noisy supporters outside, while inside all three leaders took to the stage in what is the most anticipated election. The Conservatives before us wiped out any, any rules around equity, took the word equity For the out first while, it looked like a debate between just the two political veterans, Liberal leader Kathleen Wynne and NDP leader Andrea Horvath. They didn't. You know what? When I was Minister of Education in 2006, we reintroduced equity. Ontario PC leader Doug Ford, new to provincial politics, but many say the front runner watched on. It took a couple of rounds and a timer that sounded like a ringside bell before Ford got off the ropes. It has to be stopped. Attacking win over how much executives make at a power company with government ties. Did you know about the backroom deal about doubling his compensation? Dad, are you talking to me about board? backroom deals? You're talking I'm about you, the, you and the, the developers board. in the backroom about the green okay, well, belt? And well, these two are you want, our hydro talk, bills are going through the roof while these two are doing that. And then there was this moment between Ford and win. I'm going to ask my, my friend Kathleen the, the question. Kathleen, you got a nice smile on your face there. Kath Kathleen. <laughs> so do you. you. Know, <laughs> I truly believe, I truly believe you got into politics for the right reason. I have, my question is very simply, when did you lose your way? Well, we've, you know, we've created uh, 800,000 net new jobs in this province. The economy is outstripping the growth of uh, other provinces. The bill this first of three debates offered a taste of what to expect once the official campaign gets underway on Wednesday. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. But interestingly, the importance of such televised debates might actually be waning as the campaign battleground moves to social media. Hannah Thibodeau has more on some of the online tactics you might just recognize from south of the border. Fake news. How much influence could this man have over the Ontario election? The provincial Liberals are using him to try to scare voters away from progressive Conservative leader Doug Ford. Doug Ford sounds like Donald Trump, and that's because he is like Donald Trump. It's a message you will see and hear more of in advertisements in the campaign. But what you won't necessarily see is this. This ad, made by the PCs, is only on Facebook and only seen by Ontarians who like the president. They want to reach people who are interested in Donald Trump. Derek Willis works with ProPublica, a U.S.-based independent investigative journalism organization that built a crowdsourcing tool to track paid political ads on Facebook. He says Ford's team is using the president to attract voters. If this is the kind of person that appeals to you politically, you may also be interested in the person that we're putting right in front of you. The Ontario Liberals are using a similar approach, but targeting those who like Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. It's called micro-targeting, going after different groups of voters based on things like age, gender, or political interests. In a nutshell, not everyone will experience the same election campaign. It's not politics uh, that has anything approaching the kind of regulated structure that we sort of took for granted. And um, there are a lot of negative aspects uh, to that. We saw some of those negative aspects with the improper use of millions of Facebook users' personal data. It was used to target and sway voters during the U.S. election and Brexit referendum. That's a Canada's that's former chief law electoral law officer law says this type of political advertising is relatively uncontrolled. 
cannot simply build a highway and say it's a free for all for everyone. I think uh, they need to become a uh, more accountable for what's going on on their platform. Social media platforms are trying to help users understand who is targeting them with political messages and why. Under new rules, political campaigns will have to display ads they're buying from Facebook on their pages. Canada is currently the first test country, and the Ontario election is the first big campaign where we'll see how it actually works. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. And don't forget, CBC News is tracking the polls leading up to June's election. Right now, our models show that Doug Ford's progressive conservatives remain out in front with 42% support. The Liberals and the NDP trail well behind with about 26% each. You can look at all of our poll tracker data on our website. Just go to cbc.ca slash poll tracker. Still ahead on the national, volcanic chaos continues on Hawaii's Big Island. Officials are warning people to be ready to flee as unpredictable fissures spew toxic gas and molten lava. And one in four young Canadians have put their life on hold to care for a family member. On tonight's national documentary, you'll meet Stefan Alexis, who takes care of his brother, Tor. When you're taking care of a family member, the house revolves around that family member. So you kind of have to coordinate who's gonna stay and who's gonna go out because everything is, it's like an orchestra. For many Canadians, being in your 20s means getting out in the world and starting to build your adult life. But people get dealt different hands. For some young people, maybe more than you might guess, circumstances demand sacrifice. Stefan Alexis is a college graduate, but his future is on hold. He spends hours a day providing special care to his younger brother, Tor, who has cerebral palsy and is now too old to get that care through public programs. This family needs the help, and as you'll see in our intimate portrait, Stefan was raised to honor that bond. And he's not alone. Statistics Canada has estimated one in four Canadians under the age of 30 cares for a family member. That is 1.9 million people. They may spend a few hours a week looking after an ailing grandparent or, like Stefan, they may care for a relative practically full time. An estimated 7% leave school early because of the burden. For a sense of what they go through, here's our national documentary, Caring for Tor. Are you okay? I remember, like, when we were at the hospital, like, very clearly. We waited there for a while, and then my dad came out and he was like, your brother's here. I got to see him from the class. I remember seeing other kids that were Tor's age, and they were like crawling and walking. And I was like, so when is Tor gonna start walking and talking? They're like, probably you won't be able to walk and talk. I must have been at around like four or five years old when I realized that things were a little different. And down. Name is Stefan Alexis, 24 years old. This is a team effort. There we go. <laughs> it tickles. <laughs> I'm a young caregiver. I take care of my younger sibling, Torrance. He is 21 years old, and he has cerebral palsy. He's not verbal. Um, he doesn't really have any balance. He's completely dependent. <gasps> you want to go to bed? You want to go to bed? It's not an easy job. He, is, he needs like he needs you for everything. So you have to be taking care of him 24-7. I think Tor sees the world 
simpler than, than we see it. So I feel like he appreciates the things that we take for granted. We think he sees the world in lights and shapes. Okay, buddy. A year ago when Tor turned 21, um, he graduated from high school and all the services stopped. So um, when that happened, uh, we didn't have any uh, support during the day. You're doing well. You're doing and really all good. the work kind of fell on my dad. Yeah, you should be hungry though. So that's when I was like, okay, I have to help. Mom's working full time, has her hands full, taking care of the house too, so. I'm here. Even though I wasn't like feeling great, it's you make sacrifices for your family. When people think about a caregiver, they generally think about a female. It's a very easy um, assumption to make and a very easy picture to paint. Watching my dad taking care of Tor um, has impacted me in a pretty significant way because he's shown me the other side of masculinity. He teaches me how you're supposed to be attentive to certain things and how you're supposed to like take care of your family. So I'm picking up, okay, passata sauce, pepperoni, spinach, eggs. I'll be back. When you're taking care of a family member, the house revolves around that family member. So you kind of have to coordinate who's gonna stay and who's gonna go out because everything's, it's like an orchestra. So you have to, kind of get everything in a certain balance. Time to go to bed, Torrance. Yeah. Come on, sweetheart. Turn around. There's so many little intricate details that go not into like just everyday life, but into a life where you're taking care of someone else. Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me. We love Tor to death. We love him unconditionally. We, we would do anything for him, of course, but any kind of long, continuous strain has an impact on you mentally. My friends are aiming towards like their career and they're chasing like their dreams and all that. Having to put my goals and aspirations on the back burner can be really frustrating. I can't do this forever. Um, and um, it's a tough, it's a tough place to be in because like what do I, do I pay, like how do I choose? What will happen like if I'm not there to kind of relieve the pressure? Everyone's getting older and the needs are going up and it's kind of, it's breaking the balance. He just had a really bad seizure. Right, he did? Okay. Yeah, let me come on, give you a hand. If I can't be here like physically to help, I need to find another way to help oh, out. It's 
easy ignoring these people because there's no voice. Because the people that have the voice are too tired to like raise their voices. They're already exhausted from the day to day and they don't have the energy to go out and protest. Yes. And try and like fight the government and like lobby and do all this crazy stuff because like the day to day never really stops. You don't have the energy because you're just trying to make it day to day. <laughs> Tonight's national documentary is part of a special project that aims to profile young Canadians in the midst of profound life changes. Stefan's story is just the first. The people in all of our stories have all agreed to give us intimate access to their very personal circumstances, a window into their worlds. We will let you know when the next profile is coming. And still to come on The National, an Ontario man given 15 years to live spent 11 of them fighting to prove his job made him sick. How his victory could change the way others are compensated. You don't get a trade and think of down the road that whenever you're 20 years into your trade, you're gonna find out you're, you have a terminal disease. It's too late for me, but maybe it's not too late for somebody else. So I'd have to come into the garage, take off uh, my clothes, then go straight for a shower. Oh, we remember that. It has been nearly a decade since he stepped into a printing plant, but Mitch Laprade says he can't wash that heavy smell of ink from his memory. The 57-year-old is now fighting terminal cancer, an illness that he and his doctors say is linked to his job. But as Valerie Ouellette explains, it took 11 years and a landmark ruling to prove it to Ontario's worker compensation system. One, two, three, pick. For over a decade, Mitch Laprade and his wife have split their time between hospitals and legal clinics. I remember the very first time that you had chemo. For 20 years, he worked in the printing industry, a good job with a steady paycheck. He was always health conscious and never saw his diagnosis coming. Chronic lymphocytic leukemia, a terminal blood cancer. 15 years to live and searching for answers, he was led to benzene, a cancer-causing chemical and the solvents he used at work. But convincing Ontario's Workers' Compensation Board that he's this sick because of his job hasn't been easy. Here I have a sample of a lot of the denial letters. His workers' compensation case dragged on for years. This one's from 2010. He submitted medical studies and received denials in return, with WSIB arguing he had inadequate evidence. I'm angry. It's very frustrating. Frustrated, because while he got rejection letters, the board implemented a special policy for firefighters. If they get the same disease as him, they don't have to prove their case. The board recognizes that fire smoke can cause cancer. And while the policy doesn't directly connect benzene to leukemia, it's widely understood that it's one of the major toxins that puts firefighters at risk. And according to Leprad's doctor, it's the only one that matters. The only one of those chemicals that would cause the increased risk was benzene. Most provinces have similar policies. And in a statement to CBC, DWSIB says that firefighters are compensated based on diagnosis and length of service, not exposure. The Labour Minister's office says it is reviewing compensation for all work-related cancers. This is a big issue because... Jim Brophy's research led to the implementation of the firefighters' that. policy. The he says it's time for it to be expanded to other industries. All benzene-exposed workers, no matter what their occupation is, bear this risk. The chances are better now. Leprat's lawyer says she hopes this case will set a precedent. Okay. If there's a worker out there who has CLL, 
they should be coming forward and going to the board right away and saying, I think there's a connection. At 57 with a terminal disease, Laprad knows he's running out of time. He hopes his fight hasn't been in vain and his struggle will help ensure other workers are treated fairly. Are you tired? Uh, not too bad. Valérie Wallet, CBC News, Toronto. Benzene is a common chemical. It's released during forest fires and volcanic eruptions. But when people are exposed to it at its highest levels, it is often because of where they work. Auto repair, uh, refinery workers, steel workers, coke oven workers, uh, print shops, uh, anybody working in solvents and so forth. I mean, it, it, it's an enormous number. And that number, an estimated 375,000 people across the country. If you think you're one of them, the advice is to talk to your employer about limiting your exposure or using protective gear like gloves and masks. Well, next on The National, molten rock toxic gas and a warning to be ready to flee. The sudden and unpredictable volcano eruption continues in Hawaii tonight. Get your belongings and get back out. I remember telling myself, this may be the last time I come back. And if it is, that's okay. The future I came to expect was never going to be. You have to always fight for your family, whatever is left. You're gonna lose your home. There is no more time. And even though that I do not think that I'm all that successful, I have what I need. Life is pretty good. You can stay in the know anytime, anywhere with the free CBC News app. All the local, national, international, and breaking news you need. Download it today. Tonight on The National, more dramatic scenes from Hawaii's Big Island. Four days after the Kilauea volcano started erupting, as you can see, lava is still flowing, scorching everything in its path. So far, 35 structures, many of them homes, have been destroyed. But some of the 1,700 people who were forced to evacuate have been allowed to go back briefly to collect their things. Still no word, though, when they might be able to return home for good. Five million years away from retirement with the house paid for. And retirement is nowhere near in the future now if this is what's playing out. Just watching everybody come out of there with all their things. And it's so sad. It's just so sad. And an update from officials just a couple hours ago. They say they're tracking new volcanic activity on the island. Two new fissures appear to have opened up and the whole situation is very unpredictable. They're still picking up toxic gases in the area and tourists are being warned to stay away. New York's Attorney General has stepped down after four women accused him of physically assaulting them. The allegations against Eric Schneiderman were detailed in a New Yorker article published today. But in the same statement announcing his resignation, Schneiderman wrote that he strongly contests the allegations. Schneiderman has been a very vocal supporter of the Me Too movement. Another story we're following tonight, word of a big announcement coming from the White House on the Iran nuclear deal. President Donald Trump tweeted today that he'll reveal tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern whether the U.S. will pull out. The agreement was struck in 2015, and it involved world powers waiving sanctions on Iran in exchange for placing limits on its nuclear program. Trump has until May 12th to decide whether the U.S. will continue to waive sanctions, but he is expected to announce that he will not do that, effectively withdrawing the U.S. from the deal. As New Brunswick continues to deal with record high water levels, some flood victims are now having to deal with something else, thieves. Marcus Harvey knows this all too well, but he didn't let them get away. His story is our moment of the day. I was sleeping in my bed, having a lovely restful sleep, and I heard a thud. And then immediately uh, a gentleman's voice said, you need to evacuate. And I said, why the blank do I have to evacuate? 
and then it was just uh, uh, all hell broke loose and, and uh, a rush of people running out my back door. Well, I got downstairs and uh, everybody was uh, scurrying like rats out the back door. And I jumped up on my pool deck, which is uh, right behind the house, uh, over to the down river end and looked over the edge and was able to see three gentlemen uh, wearing masks and in a red canoe trying to beat a hasty retreat with a couple of paddles. Within two hours, probably, of them breaking into my house and a short but futile boat chase, they uh, were able to nab the perpetrators. Okay, so boat chase is <laughs> a stunning phrase there. As if people don't have enough to deal with, Marcus explained that, you know, yes, they woke him up from a nap, but he had the instincts to grab his camera, take a picture, and then call the police. And, you know, it's so unfortunate that, I mean, this is a recurring story, right? Whenever mm -hmm. we talk about natural disasters, I, I remember last summer for the B.C. wildfires, th the same sort of thing happened. And even firefighters were complaining that their equipment was being stolen or damaged, their, their hoses and pumps disappearing, the ultimate insult to injury. So the serious thing here is that somebody tried to steal stuff from that guy's house. That's wrong. Obviously, you feel violated when people are in your house trying to do that. Uh, the more whimsical fun side is... You know, if the RCMP is watching in New Brunswick and they have the audio sort of transmissions of doing that chase on their boat of this stolen canoe, I don't even know what the 10 code is for a stolen canoe, but, you know, it's Canada, so there probably is one. Please send us that tape. I want to know more about that pursuit. <laughs> of course you would. <laughs> that is a national for May the 7th. Good night. Good night.